With the success that Lamont Paris, Don Staley, and other athletic coaches are having at South Carolina right now, the pressure on Shane Beamer is going to be ratcheted up in 2024. You are Locked On Gamecocks, your daily podcast on the South Carolina Gamecocks, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello, Gamecock Nation, and welcome back to the Locked On Gamecocks podcast. I am your host, Andrew Line, and you can find my written work over on Gamecock Digest on Fan Nation. Thank you so much for making the Locked On Gamecocks podcast your first watch or listen for your team every day. We are free and available, as always, both on YouTube and wherever you get your audio podcasts daily. Today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel. Make every moment more as new customers right now can join today and you'll get $200 in bonus bets if your first bet of $5 or more wins. Visit FanDuel.com slash locked on to get started. We have discussed a lot about Lamont Paris's success recently here on the Locked On Gamecocks podcast, along with the success that Don Staley and the women's basketball program have been having as well. And With success in those respective programs comes added pressure on another program, specifically the football program that is led by South Carolina's head football coach, Shane Beamer. But the thing is, it's not like it's just those two basketball programs that are doing well right now. A lot of athletic programs at South Carolina are having really good seasons in the winter season of the athletic calendar. And so Shane Beamer, because of that, is going to have a lot more pressure on him to turn things around in 2024. Lamont Paris, let's start off with him. Obviously, we all know what happened in the 2022 through 23 season. Lamont landed five-star homegrown product G.G. Jackson, brought in a notable transfer in Michi Johnson, along with Citadel transfer Hayden Brown. And while those three guys definitely helped this program out this past winter, they just did not have enough pieces. And so they wound up only winning 11 games. They were one and done in the SEC men's basketball tournament. And obviously they did not make a postseason tournament. So what does Lamont Paris do? He turns around and he dives right back into the transfer portal. And this time he adds a bunch of pieces that are all experienced and guys that have played at a high level Wherever they have come from, whether it is Taylon Cooper from the Big Ten at Minnesota, maybe a Miles Studi from Vanderbilt, and obviously B.J. Mack coming from the SoCon as he played at Wofford the past couple of years. And we have seen what Lamont Paris has done with this new group. The Gamecocks currently sitting at 20-3, and now officially tied for first place in the SEC regular season standings, and we'll discuss that a little bit more later on in the show. So... The point is, Lamont Paris right now, honestly, he's making a great case to be both the SEC and National Coach of the Year in men's college basketball, and that is a humongous accomplishment for him. But here is the sort of caveat here, and it has nothing to do with Lamont Paris. It has everything to do with Shane Beamer because, as we all know, South Carolina, I would say in terms of fan interest, it has been a football-first school Pretty much the entire time the program has been in existence, which is why so many people respect South Carolina football fans, because of how loyal that they are, despite the up and down results that that program and that team have had over the past decades, the past century, if you want to go back that far. And the thing is, football, especially in the SEC, it is the main driving force in terms of the revenue that's generated from these athletic programs. It's pretty much that way everywhere, but obviously in the SEC, especially football is king. And so if you're not getting the job done on the football field and the second highest grossing revenue generator, men's basketball with Lamont Paris in this case, is doing a heck of a lot better in such a short time You know people are probably having conversations right now. That's where I'm going with all this. You know in that administration building, maybe some phone calls between boosters. Some people are probably looking at what Lamont Paris is doing right now in just his second season in Columbia. And they're sitting there, and whether it's fair or not fair to say this, they're sitting there going, why is Shane Beamer having so much trouble getting things going? 
Now, that might sound like an overreaction because Shane Beamer did a lot of good things the first two years here at South Carolina, and he inherited a bad situation, at least in terms of the culture aspect of this football program. No denying that. And not all the issues that sort of displayed or were showcased in 2023 were on him and his coaching staff. But as we've all discussed already, some of those things that happened last season could have been avoided. They could have been. But they weren't, and it led to you not going to a bowl game. And in football, especially with the way that sport is changing right now, you can't afford to have multiple down years in a row. And then you combine that with what Lamont Paris is doing on top of what Don Staley is doing in women's college basketball. I know that people are going to point to revenue numbers with that. I'm not going to touch that. We all, I think, know the story with that. But Don Staley is the best coach in women's college basketball right now. That's what South Carolina fans care about the most. How is the team performing? right? They are the standard in that sport. Mark Kingston with baseball led the team back to the Super Regionals in 2023 as a top 25 team coming back in 2024. This offense, this batting lineup has a chance to potentially break records. They are that deep one through nine. They have a chance to go back to Omaha for the first time since 2012. Been way too long since that program has been in Omaha. And Guess what? It doesn't end there. I'm going to pull up a photo real quick for those of you watching today's show on YouTube. And don't worry, if you're listening to this on an audio podcast app, I'll read through all these real quickly. This is a photo that was posted by Gamecock Athletics X account um, earlier on Thursday afternoon. And this photo basically shows all of these teams that are ranked, teams that participate in the winter season. So, again, women's basketball, number one in the country. Men's tennis, number four in the country. Equestrian is number four in the country. Women's golf, sixth in the country. Baseball, as high as 12th in the preseason polls. Men's basketball, 15th in the AP poll. Softball, as high as 17th in those polls. Women's indoor track is 17th. Women's swim and dive is 21st. And men's indoor track is 21st. So, That is 10 programs right there that are participating throughout the winter season and are ranked in the top 25. You know that fans, administrators, boosters at all different levels, people are looking at the football program right now and they're saying, okay, Shane, look at what all these teams are doing. Now, what are you going to do this coming year? And again, I'm not saying that's fair. In a way, I definitely don't think it's fair. But this just means that if Shane Beamer does not get things going back on the right track again this coming fall, there are going to be some hard questions asked behind closed doors. And who knows? Depending on how the rest of these teams, these other sports teams keep performing throughout the rest of this athletic calendar year, um, maybe it could lead to them having a quicker trigger in terms of making a decision on the future of the football program. We're not going to dive any further than that, but I'll just leave it at that. So um, Lamont Paris and Don Staley and all those athletic programs having that success, it is great. Obviously, South Carolina fans, again, I've said it before, it can be football, it can be water polo. If you're fantastic in your sport, you're going to get love from this fan base. But the football team right now, we don't know what direction it's trending. We don't know if it's a positive direction or a negative direction. And so, in 2024, we're going to find out a lot about what Shane Beamer is going to do to try to get things back on track and whether or not maybe he can. And if he can't, or he shows a lot of signs that indicate that he can't this coming fall, then uh, maybe there is some change. We'll see what happens with all that. Now, Don Staley and the women's basketball team are going to be playing the Missouri Tigers later tonight. And don't worry, I'm not going to bore y'all by actually breaking down this entire matchup because, as I've said before, uh, there's no need to. Missouri's nowhere near on South Carolina's level. I expect this to be a blowout win tonight at home. However, Camilla Cardoso will not be playing. And that means that South Carolina is going to have to experiment a little bit. And I think that they should. So, what kind of lineups should they roll out there on the court tonight? We'll discuss that in just a couple moments right here on Locked On Gamecocks. Today's show is brought to you by FanDuel. Now, we're just a couple days away from Super Bowl 58 taking place. And right now on FanDuel Sportsbook, they have got a ton of specialty bets, player prop bets, and more. So, I've got one for y'all today that I think, honestly, is pretty much a shoe win. Travis Kelsey 
getting 25 plus receiving yards in each half. I believe that the odds for that player prop are listed at plus 100, maybe plus 150. But right now, the point is you could make, I believe if I'm doing this correctly, over 100 bucks. If you put down just $5 or maybe a little bit more on that player prop bet, Travis Kelsey's been Patrick Mahomes' main guy for several years now. That wide receiver core has been uh, very inconsistent, to say the least, this NFL season. And also the 49ers, they got a pretty stout defense. So expect number 87 to get a lot of targets on Sunday night. New customers, join today and you'll get $200 in bonus bets if your first bet of $5 or more wins. Just visit FanDuel.com slash locked on to sign up. That's FanDuel.com slash locked on. Make every moment more with FanDuel, an official sportsbook partner of the NFL. Welcome back to this Thursday edition of the Locked On Gamecocks podcast. We cover your South Carolina Gamecocks every single day. And as always, a really big thank you to each and every one of you everydayers who make the Locked On Gamecocks podcast your first listen wherever you get your audio podcasts daily or your first watch on YouTube. Camilo Cardoso is with Brazil's national team on the women's side, obviously, as they are getting set to go through some Olympic qualifiers and uh, are trying to make it to the Olympic Games this summer in Paris. So, with Camila Cardoso currently MIA for South Carolina's women's basketball team, Dawn Staley, at least for this game against Missouri, she should experiment with some different lineup combinations. Because, obviously, again, it's never too early to somewhat prepare yourselves for the future. Because starting next season... South Carolina, they're going to have a roster at this point in time where they're going to lack sort of that taller, lankier five player. Obviously, they had the luxury of having Aaliyah Boston on this team for four straight years and watch her basically just dominate the competition and also get a lot better from a footwork and technique standpoint to where it was pretty hard to stop her unless you just double teamed her for all 40 minutes that she was out there. And then the Camilla Cardoso, she's six foot seven. She has a high motor. And also, again, I think that she is a lot more skilled than people either insinuate or give her credit for, however you want to look at it. But starting next year, Camilla Cardoso will be gone, which means South Carolina won't have that player exactly that they can just throw the ball up to and pretty much just assume that's a free two points right there. They're not going to have that. And so you've got to find new ways to generate offense. And that is why when they play the Tigers later tonight, I think that Don Staley should look at running three different lineup combinations, these three specific ones. So I'll break them down one by one here. The first one is more of a small ball lineup with an emphasis on perimeter shooting. So, in this lineup, I have Sundia Fagan at the 5, Bree Hall at the 4, Tessa Johnson at the 3, Tahina Pow Pow at the 2, and Raven Johnson at the 1. Now, obviously, with Tahina Pow Pow being in there, I'm talking about pretty much this season. This would be if Camilla Cardoso has a game where she gets into foul trouble, she's sitting on the bench, and South Carolina's actually having some struggles defensively stopping their opponent. If you roll out that lineup, that's going to be your best lineup in terms of three-point shooting. Raven Johnson obviously shoots a lot better than people give her credit for. Tina Pow Pow, one of the best three-point shooters in terms of percentage in the SEC and the entire country. Tessa Johnson, that's pretty much her strength offensively is shooting the three-point ball. Bree Hall is a much improved three-point shooter, a more consistent three-point shooter. And Sanaya Fagan, I think that she's even hit a three or two this season. So she can step out from the hoop a little bit and shoot from, I would say, 10 to 15 feet comfortably, and then maybe even a three-pointer if she has to. But the point here is that this lineup, sure, a little bit smaller. You're sacrificing a little bit of rebounding, probably having Bree Hall at the four. But this lineup is going to be able to shoot the ball really well from behind the three-point line. Now, if you want to go with a more speedy transition type offense, you could roll out this lineup. Ashlyn Watkins, Bree Hall, Tessa Johnson, Mylejo Fullwiley, and Raven Johnson. So, in terms of pushing the pace, obviously, with Raven Johnson and Malaysia Fullwiley, both of those guards, they have no issue running the floor coast-to-coast coast trying to make something happen, whether it is they take the ball themselves or they try to dish it off to one of their teammates. 
Tessa Johnson and Bree Hall, they could pretty much be your two players that kind of run to the wings or run to the corners. They'll be there for a three-pointer if the defense crashes and they leave those spots open. Ashlyn Watkins, again, I think I've said this before on this show, and I, if I haven't, I'll say it now. I think she is almost a carbon copy of Letitia and me here. She is very physical. She is very strong. She is a fantastic defensive player and rebounder. She can play out to the perimeter on defense. And she also is willing to run the floor. And last season, it was, I think, Raven Johnson, Letitia Me here that had a really good connection in transition when they were running the floor. And this season, it's um, it's Malaysia Fulwiley and Ashlyn Watkins that have kind of become the new duo that really like to link up with each other when they're running the floor. They've both known each other, obviously, since they were playing, I believe, middle school or high school ball. So they have a longtime relationship and friendship that goes back a long ways. In my opinion, if you're wanting to get speed and you want to really emphasize running the floor on offense and trying to get some easier buckets, some easier shot opportunities, catch the defense flat-footed, that's the lineup you want to roll out against Missouri on Thursday night. And then I got one more for you. Obviously, it can't just be all about offense. You do have to also play defense as well. So if you're trying to really lock down your opponent, this would be a lineup I would roll out there in Camilla Cardoso's absence. Sanai Fagan at the five, Ashton Watkins at the four, Bree Hall at the three, Malaysia Fulwally at the two, and Raven Johnson at the one. This is essentially kind of your starting lineup probably tonight without Fulwally being in there, but if you're looking to get more defense, Fulwally playing that two makes a lot of sense. Tessa Johnson and Tahina Pow Pow, again, their main strength on offense is their perimeter shooting. Now, Pow Pow can be very crafty in terms of going through any open space in the mid-range area and finding a spot near the rim to put the ball up. But again, that's not something that's necessarily going to be her calling card every time she gets the basketball. Full Wiley, it's a different story. Full Wiley, when she's on the floor and she goes full speed, she's pretty much the fastest player between both teams every time she is out there. So... If you're going to say that she also can help you out there on offense, it should carry over on defense as well. Now, Fulwale has had to learn a little bit on defense that you can't always just be right up on the primary ball handler that, hey, people on this level can actually make you look a little silly. There are some people, there are some guards that are almost just as fast as you and also have some ball handling ability. So there were times earlier in the season where Fulwale, she would get beat off the ball way too easily. And she would be in a recovery position trying to catch back up. She's gotten a lot better with that, I would say, over the past few games. She still has her moments. But because of how fast she is and how quickly she can explode laterally, I think that if you're going with defense, if you're trying to, again, force the opponent to really have to earn every point they get for a certain stretch, those are the five that you want to roll out there on the floor. Now, maybe Don Staley has thrown those lamps out there a couple times already this season, but tonight, especially with Camilla Cardoso being gone and considering the fact that you're playing the Missouri Tigers, again, a team that has really struggled this season and probably is going to struggle again tonight in the CLA, I think that this is the kind of game where, honestly, you want to play this game to get ready for March, to get ready for next season when you don't have Camilla Cardoso on this team anymore. So I think tonight's a good opportunity for Don Staley and the Gamecocks in that aspect. Now, men's basketball is going to get a couple days off here before they take the floor again on Saturday against the Van Roo Commodores. But in the meantime, there's been a lot of talk about the SEC regular season title race. Auburn beat Alabama last night, and so therefore, the Gamecocks are now in a three-way tie for first place in the SEC standings. However, there's still a feeling of disrespect revolving around South Carolina when that conversation comes up. And I'll explain why a little bit more in just a few moments right here on Locked On Gamecocks. Today's show is brought to you by Game Time. Now, let me ask you all a question. If you were to go to Las Vegas and you were to buy a ticket to the Super Bowl and had an extra $100 when using code VEGAS100, what would you do with the extra money? Well, you could obviously stay in Las Vegas for a little while longer. You could have yourself some fun on the Strip. You could go maybe to some restaurants. Maybe you could take some of that money and put it on some prop bets over on FanDuel Sportsbook. But 
Maybe you also want to make it back home to South Carolina. So if you decide to do that, you can maybe take that extra money to buy a ticket to see American rap artist T.I. at the Township Auditorium in Columbia on Friday, February the 16th, where you could hear some of his biggest hits like What You Know, You Don't Know Me, I promise those two, those are two separate songs right there, and Rubber Band Man. Take the guesswork out of buying tickets with Game Time. Right now, all Game Time users get $100 off a big game ticket with code VEGAS100. Terms apply. Just download the Game Time app and use code VEGAS100 for $100 off a big game ticket. Or, if you're not going to the game, use code Locked On for $20 off your first purchase when you create an account. Download Game Time today. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. Welcome back to today's edition of the Locked On Gamecocks podcast, where we cover your team every single day in just 30 minutes. Now, a couple of shows ago, I talked about the new kind of pressure that South Carolina is going to be under now that they are officially recognized by both the Associated Press and USA Today coaches polls as one of the top 25 teams in all of men's college basketball. And with that new kind of pressure, with their new kind of stature that they have garnered for themselves throughout this season, South Carolina is now also dealing with a different kind of disrespect. Here's what I mean by that. Auburn, again, beat Alabama last night, which means that South Carolina is now in a three-way tie for first place in the SEC regular season standings. So... I, of course, stayed up and I watched SEC Now. I believe it was Dari Noka and Damian Fishback who were the two discussing all of the action from last night. And they got to a segment where they talked about the different tiers of the SEC right now in terms of men's basketball. And in Tier 1, they basically had all the teams that are currently ranked in the top 25. So that included Tennessee, Kentucky, South Carolina, Alabama, and Auburn. But here's the thing. When they talked about that group, they were talking about how there is a certain energy that you're going to have to bring every single night because when teams face you now, they're going to be looking to upset you. You're now going to be looked at as a team that could be a resume builder for other teams that are trying to get into the NCAA tournament. And they weren't wrong on that point. But the thing was, Dari Noka eventually went over to South Carolina and he asked Damian Fishback, he was like, Are they ready for what's to come? Are they ready for that new sort of requirement now? What's going to be asked of them in terms of the energy that they have to bring? And I don't think Darinoka meant that in a bad way. I do want to make that abundantly clear. But at the same time, it kind of does feel like a slight. You know, like, yeah, South Carolina men's basketball fans, they get it. The Gamecocks are not usually in this kind of spot at this point in the season. I think everybody understands that. But... It kind of, again, just feels like that people are waiting for South Carolina to stumble, for South Carolina to drop a game that they now probably should not drop. And the thing is, South Carolina continues to have questions asked of them in terms of, are they prepared for this moment? Do they have enough talent to continue to do what they're doing right now? But questions aren't being asked about some of these other teams outside of Kentucky. Kentucky does have a lot of questions about their defense, and those have rightfully been brought up time and time again this season. But with these other three teams, people don't talk about, in the national media space, what happens to Tennessee if Dalton Connect just drops off? What if he hits a cold slump? Are we sure he's going to continue to score 25-plus points a night? I get it. He is really good. He's really talented. But what if he has an off night? Could Tennessee get beat by maybe half the teams in this conference? Probably. What about Auburn? Auburn's gotten some big wins this year. But you look at that schedule of theirs. They've not played many big games away from their home arena. So what's going to happen when they do end up doing that before the regular season's over? When they get to the SEC tournament or the NCAA tournament? Are we sure they're going to be able to handle the fact that they don't have the entire crowd behind them where they could just feed off all that energy throughout the entire basketball game? And what about Alabama? You know, they haven't had too many slip-ups, but last night was a pretty bad look for them. Yes, it was a rivalry game. Yes, it was on the road. But they lost by 18, 19 points to Auburn. And Auburn pretty much dictated the entire pace of that game. So... Can Alabama handle 
or weather the storm, whenever they do face a team that actually dictates how the game flow is going? Those are all fair questions to ask. And yet when those teams get talked about, you don't ever hear those questions get brought up, honestly. Unless maybe they lose and then they get brought up. But South Carolina wins six games in a row and they're still having questions asked about them. I want to use an analogy real quick to really hammer home this point. Let's say there's a weightlifting class in high school. And in that weightlifting class, you got a couple of athletes from different sports teams that are in that class for whatever reason, right? And one day, the teacher decides that y'all are going to go into the weight room and you're going to have a max out day. Obviously, I put max out in quotations there because in this situation, who you're going to put money on is going to lift the most weight. You're going to put money on the kids that are actually on sports teams, kids that go through weightlifting, that go through practices every day with their teams. But in this situation, let's say there's one kid in the weightlifting class that's not an athlete on one of these teams. And when you look at them, they don't look like a kid that would be an athlete, that would be on one of those sports teams. And so... Everybody just has a preconceived notion that, you know, when this kid walks up to, say, do back squats, they're like, that kid doesn't stand a chance. That kid will be lucky if he can just lift the bar. And then the kid turns around and stuns everybody by lifting just as much weight as all of the athletes in the weightlifting class. That is what's going on with South Carolina right now. Now, listen, I'm not saying that the players on South Carolina's basketball team are wimpy kids. I promise you that. If I ran into a Taylon Cooper, Miji Johnson, gosh knows Josh Gray, um, I, I would be worried for my safety if I had made them angry and I was in that kind of situation, right? But my whole point with bringing that up is this. South Carolina, they don't have the prototypical look of a top 25 team, right? Again, they don't have that Dalton Connect that averages 25 plus points a night. They don't have a head coach that's been to the NCAA tournament countless times as a head coach. Assistant coach is different, but as a head coach, like a Bruce Pearl. Lamont Paris has never led a team to a number one overall seed as the head coach of the program. Nate Oates has. And so just because South Carolina has not done it yet, at least in this current era of their program's history under Lamont Paris, everybody continues to look at them and they kind of look at them sideways. Like, you're not supposed to be in this situation. You're not supposed to be here. And you're right. In the media's eyes, at least the media that was there at media days, South Carolina's supposed to be the worst team in the conference still. They're not supposed to be here. But guess what? That hasn't mattered at all. Not to Lamont Paris, not to his players, not to anybody. So, you know, I, I, with this entire deal, in terms of them being disrespected, look, it's going to continue to happen no matter what. South Carolina could be the number two seed, a number two seed on that line for the NCAA tournament. And people probably sit there and say they're the weakest number two seed in this entire tournament. They would still get disparaged. It's probably going to happen no matter what. It's just going to come in different forms. But uh, from a fan standpoint, I can understand why you would be frustrated about this. So my advice to you is just, you know, just prepare yourselves for it because it's going to come no matter what they do throughout the rest of this season. With that being said, that's going to do it for today's edition of the Locked On Gamecocks podcast. Thank you all so much for tuning in. As always, I really appreciate all of your time. What are your thoughts on the increased pressure Shane Beamer could go through if Lamont Paris and all these other teams continue to perform at the level that they are performing at this winter season? What are your thoughts on what Don Staley should do with her lineup tonight against Missouri? What combination do you want to see hit the hardwood? And lastly, how do you feel about the new kind of disrespect South Carolina is getting on the men's basketball front? Let me know your thoughts down below in the comments section if you watch today's show on YouTube or you could shoot me a direct message on X at a line underscore SC if you listen to today's show on an audio podcast app. But once again, thank y'all so much for tuning in. Have a great rest of your Thursday and I'll be sure to catch y'all on the next show of the Locked On Gamecocks podcast.